Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jason, for that introduction. And thank you very much for arranging the talk also. So uh, the, today, is, what I'm going to talk about is basically the work that I, I did as part of my PhD at the University of Exeter. Then when I joined uh, as a postdoc at Cornell, I completed it and published it. So this work is now published in MN RAS basically. Uh, so uh, one of the most important questions that we want to ask about exoplanet atmosphere is like, uh, what are the characteristics of the, of the exoplanet atmosphere? And uh, for that, yes. Uh, so first we have to start understanding what, like uh, planetary atmosphere in general sense. So let's come to our uh, own uh, Earth here. Now, most of that we know about the planetary atmosphere is through Earth. So from that, we know that uh, the most important, uh, one of the most important aspects of any planetary atmosphere is its pressure temperature structure. So here in the figure, you can see that this is the pressure temp, uh, the, the average pressure temperature structure of Earth's atmosphere, where you have different layer, troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere. And then you can see how it varies, like it de decreases, increases. And uh, these, uh, this complete pressure temperature structure governs the uh, the different physical aspects of the atmosphere, like formation of clouds, rain, instability, convection, all the diff the ozone layer, stratosphere, all this is governed by the this pressure temperature structure. And uh, uh, this and this pressure temperature structure is determined by the chemistry of the atmosphere, radiative balance, so so many different factors that that are important for an atmosphere. Now for Earth, uh, we have the luxury to like uh, launch radio sondes as I uh, showing the figure here, where you can launch, uh, uh, attach an instrument and get the measurement of the atmosphere. Or even for solar system planets like here, I'm showing for the Huygens mission for Titan, we can just launch uh, their spacecraft uh, and it will launch this probe inside the atmosphere and you get the vertical structure of the atmosphere. And using this uh, vertical structure, you can learn a lot about uh, the, uh, the Earth's atmosphere or the solar system planets. But how do we do this for exoplanet uh, planets? Because if you want to understand exoplanet atmospheres, we need to get their pressure temperature structure. So this is very difficult. And of course, as in, in any field of astronomy, we have uh, always just electromagnetic radiation to do that. So here, in the, this is a very nice figure from one of the uh, large Hubble uh, large programs where you can see uh, uh, the different, uh, uh, using different electromagnetic radiation wavelengths, which uh, uh, levels of atmosphere you can probe. Like using the extreme UV or X-ray spar UV, you can probe the top of the like the thermosphere or the exosphere part of the atmosphere. While uh, if you go towards the uh, the longer wavelengths like the middle UV and visible infrared, you can uh, penetrate deeper. So this uh, th this is just a uh, overview of like uh, which different parts of radiation you can use to probe atmosphere. So in in today's talk, I'll just I'm just going to be talking about uh, the from the middle UV to the visible and IR. Uh, because though that is the part of the atmosphere which is quite dense, so uh, you can uh, we are modeling this part of the atmosphere where we can assume local thermodynamic equilibrium (LT). Because if you want to model exosphere, thermosphere, you are then in the non-LT regime. So today I'm going to be just talk about the observations, interpretation, and modeling of the LT regime. So middle UV to visible and IR. So uh, now, if you uh, like uh, the in the exoplanet, uh, studying exoplanet atmospheres is motivated by observation. So where do we get most of the uh, information from about exoplanet atmosphere is uh, by these two techniques, which is like eclipse spectroscopy, primary eclipse spectroscopy and secondary eclipse spectroscopy, or uh, which, you, which you call transit. So in this, you can see when the planet goes in front of the host star, there's a decrease in that is how you detect the planet and uh, when uh, and uh, uh, some of the uh, radiation that goes through the limb of the planet, you can see here, and that is what we capture using our telescopes, and you can get the information about the limb. That is transmission spectroscopy, and this is uh, how we do it. Like this is, you are seeing a plot from one of the, my papers where uh, x-axis is the wavelength and the y-axis is the radius ratio, the planets to star radius ratio. And from this, we can actually get the information of its atmosphere like which particular species are present, where it is absorbing. So here you can see this is one of the one of the famous exoplanets, HD 20945b, you can see sodium, potassium, water. But here you are just getting the information about the limb of the atmosphere, uh, like where you go from the day to the night side. And uh, and one more thing to remember is this, uh, like in the transmission spectrum, we are just proving a very small part of the atmosphere. Here, what I'm showing here is the temperature and pressure plot, very small part of the atmosphere we are probing, which is quite high in the atmosphere around one millibar region. So, uh, and we are just looking at the limb. So if we want to go deeper in the atmosphere, what do we do? So there is one uh, good thing that is secondary eclipse. 
So in the secondary eclipse spectroscopy, what we are doing is when the planet is just going behind the star, we are getting planet plus star signal and you are subtracting the stellar signal when it goes behind. So from that, you get the, uh, the entire day side spectrum of the planet. So this is uh, secondary eclipse spectroscopy and this is what the spectrum looks like, which is the flux of the planet to uh, uh, flux of the star, uh, ratio of the uh, planet to stellar flux plotted against the wavelength. So uh, these two techniques give the information about the different parts of the atmosphere. That's why it is uh, both are important to get the full picture of the atmosphere. And one more thing like transmission spectroscopy is like you get high SNR. So you can like uh, get good data from this, but eclipse spectroscopy is difficult in terms of observation because the SNR is low. Uh, and the, uh, But uh, with JWST, this can change because you are going into the infrared for uh, many of the exoplanets. And in emission spectra, you probe a bigger part of the atmosphere, as you can see, like you go all the way up to one bar. So you can go deeper and get uh, a bigger, uh, so these are much better to, uh, emission spectra, spectroscopy is much better to uh, constrain the pressure temperature structure of the atmosphere. Now, this is like the observational part. Now, we do, uh, now for exoplanets, uh, for hot Jupiter, warm Neptune, these kind of planets, we don't have any strong cons constraints. And why we are focusing on hot Jupiter and warm Neptune exoplanets, because they are the best in terms of SNR. Uh, because they are very close. Uh, oops, sorry. And uh, so, but how do we model this atmosphere? So that is what the next part comes into where. And so here, this is our modeling approach that we uh, take here. So we need to start from the basics. So let's like first, uh, we have information of the host star. We know the brightness uh, of the stars so from and the distance of the planet from the host star. So we compute how much of energy is getting dumped from the host star to the planet. That is our basic main source of energy. You have internal heat also, but uh, there is still a debate on that, uh, like how much important, but we assume uh, like uh, a temperature of uh, 100 Kelvin for uh, these planets for the internal heat uh, in, in, in this models. And you start with the basic host star uh, flux. Then, uh, then the first is you start with the initial PT profile, solve the radiative transfer in each layer of the atmosphere, compute equilibrium chemistry. Now, this is the important step. Now, for exoplanets, we from observations we have basic handle over some species like sodium, potassium, or but we don't have uh, don't know about the overall composition of the atmosphere. But it's reasonable to as, uh, assume that these are hydrogen helium dominated atmospheres, and they, because they are hot, the assumption of equilibrium chemistry can be valid. So that is what we do. We, we compute our atmospheric chemistry using equilibrium chemistry. So you solve radiative transfer, uh, you compute equilibrium chemistry, then using the equilibrium chemical abundances, you compute opacities. And this is done iteratively. Uh, you iterate this until finally you get a pressure temperature structure that is in uh, uh, radiative convective equilibrium. That is, you conserve the energy in each layer of the atmosphere and atmosphere as a whole, uh, and also hydrostatic equilibrium. And this is then uh, how you get a, a pressure temperature structure that is a representative of that planetary atmosphere. And this is the technique that we have followed in, uh, in this uh, work. And uh, now while developing these models, one of the other questions is we have to, we have to make many model choices. Like, uh, like if you have to compute opacities, what opacities do you use? Like sodium and potassium, uh, you have the opacities, but there are different broadening structure and that is dependent on the type of the atmosphere you have. So there are like two standard method, uh, like uh, techniques developed by uh, different groups. One is like called Allard and one is called Burroughs. So we have, to, uh, we, uh, while developing our models, we try this different profiles and look how does it affect the pressure temperature structure. Uh, so we realize that uh, they don't have any significant effect that could be detected with current instruments or near future instruments. You can see the effect on the pressure temperature structure with different profiles is negligible here also in the emission spectrum, uh, the planet flux, it's negligible. So although there are differences with the, uh, uh, it is not, we can't differentiate them. So, but, uh, so here we had to make a choice. So here we made a choice of using the alar profile that is a more uh, 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 quantum mechanically, they have calculated uh, like the different profiles. So that is what we did. Similarly, we have to make a choice of different opacities. And when we develop these models, we, we make this choice and do the sensitivity studies. And in that we find many things. So this was one of the important findings in our study, like what happens if we include H minus opacity? This is one of the molecules that is very common uh, in the 50s or 60s became very important for star, stars. Uh, so uh, here, when we included H minus opacities, you can see that it has the potential to create strong inversions. 
in many of the hot Jupiter and ultra hot Jupiter planets been noticed. And uh, so previously, uh, uh, the inversions in uh, hot Jupiter and ultra hot Jupiters were uh, like most of the people were thinking about uh, titanium oxide and vanadium, uh, vanadium oxide to be the most common species. But here we are showing that we, he, uh, that even, so in this simulation, the TI of UI is condensed because uh, we are going to extreme of uh, the chemistry. In that case, uh, we see that H minus is actually able to form in the red color curve. You can see the H minus able to form an inversion uh, even without the presence of TiO. In the blue color curve also, you see a small inversion, but not as strong as due to H minus. This is basically formed due to wings of sodium and potassium. So this is what we see that H minus can have substantial effect on uh, uh, in forming thermal inversions. And moreover, H minus can be detect, uh, detected in transmission spectroscopy. Here you can see a plot with H minus and without H minus, blue color is without. And you can clearly see how it actually uh, makes the transmission spectrum almost like a flag. So this is what happens when you uh, have a cloud also. So if you just, uh, that's why I have showed here optical and near infrared have uh, different colors. So if you just have uh, an optical data, you won't be able to differentiate if it is H minus opacity or clouds, it might be difficult. So uh, you have to go to the near infrared. So if you have optical and near infrared data, uh, data you can see there is this uh, small, uh, the RP bar is decreases uh, like rapidly around 1.6. This is basically due to the uh, boundary absorption of uh, H minus opacity and this uh, and like the uh, a study will soon come out which where we have actually seen this in one of the exoplanets. So this uh, so this is one of the findings in the study which shows that the H minus has the capability to form strong inversions and uh, it can be really detectable in uh, uh, transmission spectrum in, and it also because it forms inversion and changes the PT profile dramatically it can also cause uh, the emission spectrum. Uh, you can see with and without H minus opacity, you can strong uh, have a strong effect on the emission spectrum. And actually you can detect uh, uh, H minus as an emission feature rather than absorption. I'll come to that details in, in a bit. So this is about H minus opacity. And uh, along with that, we also found about ion opacity. Now ion opacity is important for many of the, many of the stars like m top stars also. And here also for hot Jupiter and um, an ultra hot Jupiter, we find F uh, ion opacity could form actually secondary inversions. It cannot form as strong inversion as uh, H minus opacity from here, you can see here, but it will form an inversion in the higher parts of the atmosphere, like higher up in the atmosphere it is forming. You can see with and without H uh, FU, uh, ion opacity, we can see this strong inversion here is basically due to TIOVO. Uh, so the iron cannot replicate that, but uh, if you want to create, uh, but iron can form strong inversion in the higher part of the atmosphere. But this uh, capability of iron to uh, form inversion is also dependent on the host stellar type. So in the spectrum here, you can see iron has a strong uh, opacities in the uh, in the near, uh, in the near UV and optical part. You can see this region of there. There is where iron strongly uh, uh, has opacity. So only if the stellar uh, the host star has a strong a strong flux in those particular wavelengths, it uh, it can form inversion. So uh, so if you go to the uh, like hotter stars or A stars or something. So like Kelt nine is one of the example. In that case, iron can form strong inversions. Uh, without even TIOPO. So in, we can see that iron has the capa capability to form strong inversion, but is dependent on the host star type. So this, this can happen for many different opacities. And here I'm just giving an example of iron. And uh, so it can form strong inversion, it has different effects. And, uh, and, uh, and for emission also, uh, you can see there is strong uh, uh, features in the optical and near infrared that you can see uh, because of iron. And this can be related, uh, we believe that this can be detected using JWST and because it's a very strong signature. And similarly for, uh, uh, but yeah, means uh, its effect on the pressure temperature structure can be detected, but JWST does not cover the optical part. So we will still need Hubble or the telescopes that are working in the uh, optical region to confirm this. And same for H minus also, because it's uh, quite strong in the optical, but uh, in the infrared, it has some features. So these are, uh, there are many different tests we did for this paper and uh, for the details, you can of course see the paper. So these are the few I just showed here. But when we develop a grid of models, we have to make uh, like, what are the main parameters that affect the spectrum quite uh, uh, dramatically or like have a strong effect. So uh, for a planetary atmosphere, water is important. One is the circulation, atmospheric circulation factor. Now we know uh, that uh, these hot Jupiter planets are very close. And so we are assuming that they are tidally locked is a fairly reasonable assumption. So they are tidally locked. So imagine all of the flux is just coming on the day side. And if there is a presence of a strong atmosphere, the winds will take uh, the flux to the night side and there will be cooling in the atmosphere. Now, how much is this cooling? How uh, wind velocities? We don't have a 
handle over that. So in our, uh, when we developed this grid of models, we, this was the, one of the variables that is the atmospheric circulation factor where we went from 0.25 to one, where one includes means that all the flux is just dumped on the day side and nothing is transported on the night side. So it's the hottest day side you get. And as you go towards the lower values, you're cooling the atmosphere. So 0.25 means the 0.75 uh, times your day side flux is transported to the night side. So this is how we incorporate uh, the atmospheric circulation factor. Then the next is metallicity. Now we don't know what are the metallic, we get the host star, handle over the host star metallicities, but we don't know about the uh, planetary atmospheric metallicities. Now what I'm here just showing is a plot of, uh, on the x-axis you have metallicity and on the y-axis you have the mole fraction, that is the abundances of different species. So you can see generally as you go from solar, one axis solar to 10,000, so that is a very high amount of metallicity, the atmosphere starts becoming, uh, uh, it's, it starts becoming uh, dominated by different species. Like initially it's mainly hydrogen helium dominated, but as you go to higher metallicity, the dominant of other species starts uh, increasing and hydrogen helium starts decreasing. But here, because uh, we are just concentrating on hydrogen helium dominated atmosphere, so we restrict maximum to 200 times solar uh, metallicity in our grid. And the other reason is also the pressure broadening, which becomes very important and we don't have handle over like how it, uh, when we go into the thousand X, because so many species are important, the pressure broadening on each species on each other species becomes important. So how do you take this into account? So very, uh, it's very, it's a difficult problem. So we have not yet figured it out. So in this grid, we restrict up to, uh, we restricted uh, ourselves up to 200 times solar metallic. Then the next is the carbon to oxygen ratio. And this is also one of the variables in the grid where we went to subsolar value, that is 0.35 is a solar value, a subsolar value, 0.55 is a solar value. And we went to maximum 1.5. And you can clearly see the carbon to oxygen ratio has a very strong effect on the abundances of uh, carbon species. Like uh, the abundance of CO almost remains constant because it has just one carbon and one oxygen. But if you see water decreases, while the abundance of uh, HCN, hydrogen cyanide, uh, uh, then methane, this uh, increases while PIO, BO, and C even CO2 decreases as you go to higher CO2 ratio. So that's why it has a dramatic effect on the chemistry of the uh, atmosphere. That's why these were the three variables that we developed on the grid. So total of like uh, four, uh, six, and uh, four for recirculation factor, six for metallicity, and six for carbon to oxygen ratios. These were all our uh, grid parameters. And this is, uh, and this is how we developed our, sorry? Uh, three minutes left, just one. Oh, three minutes, okay. Uh, so this is how we developed our this uh, the big grid of uh, called atmospheric library of far away world for 89 Jup uh, or Jupiter and warm Neptune exoplanets, and this has like different atmospheric variables and observational features of transmission and emission spectrum. So and uh, what we did initially we did like sensi uh, sensitivity studies of like how the metallicity affects the platy profiles in the spectrum. You can see that it heats the atmosphere. Uh, as you go from low to higher metallicity, there is a big effect on the transmission factor. The wings are broadened, but they, it does not affect the chemistry much. Then we did the study on the effect of the C2 ratio. How does the C2 ratio affect the pressure temperature structure, chemistry, uh, uh, and the transmission spectrum? You can see that different species become uh, important in different C2 regimes and affect the emission spectrum. So this can be used to, like, we can get a handle on what is the C2 ratio of the planet and metallicity or the recirculation factor in the atmosphere using this uh, using this grid and sensitivity studies. And here I'm just showing for some planets, but in the grid you have many planets. And one of the important things that we did is like while we were developing this, the important data came from WASP 121B. This is ultra hot Jupiter. And there actually we detected a thermal inversion for the first time in exoplanet atmosphere. Here you can see we saw a water as an emission feature instead of an absorption as you see for brown rocks. And this was the first detection of the uh, stratosphere. And this is one of the initial applications of the grid when we were developing. Similarly, the grid can be applied in many different uh, ways uh, so, uh, for different uh, planets. This is just for emission. So uh, yeah, since I'm like out of time, uh, I'm just give, give you the take home messages. Like we have developed a self-consistent library that can be used to plan and interpret the observation using JWS and various different telescopes uh, and constrain different properties of the atmosphere. The choice of alkali line wing profiles is too small to be detected by current instruments, uh, including JWST. But H minus opacity has a very strong potential to form strong invergence and a very strong feature in the transmission spectra resembling clouds. And iron opacity can create thermal inversion with a strong dependence on the host star type. And ultra hot Jupiter was 120 when we has a temperature inversion on its day side atmosphere. That is what we have found using the, this grid and many different, many discoveries like will uh, hopefully come uh, using this grid, I hope. So thank you very much for your time. And yes.
Great, yeah. thank you. Of course, open uh, questions. Mm -hmm. If uh, anybody has questions, feel free to uh, raise your hand and then I'll call on you and you've, you can feel free to unmute yourself and uh, just ask. Uh, so before, or while people are finding the unmute buttons, um, can you tell me, are, are these publicly available grids or, and, and if so, where can I get them? Yes, good point. So these are the public, uh, these are uh, totally publicly available and we have the link in our Google Drive and also one server they have uh, uh, added this grid. So both the links are available in the paper where you can download it, everything. Thank you. All the PT profiles, chemistry, transmission spectrum, emission spectrum and contribution function. And if you are if you are like modeling any specific plant, you can tell us. We will try to accommodate that because as we know that JWS proposals are on the horizon, and many people are rushing towards modelers. Do you, so uh, while I uh, abuse my host privileges, do you have any um, uh, idea of, of what the limiting factor in the accuracy of these models are, and and do you? What's the plan to improve that? Yes, so there are many. So one, so one thing is we have assumed equilibrium chemistry, as I mentioned here. Uh, so the next, so uh, for uh, for hot Jupiter planets like ultra hot Jupiter, it might not be much effect. So one is like uh, we haven't included non-equilibrium effects, that is uh, vertical mixing and photochemistry. Now this is missing in our current uh, grid. It is there in the model, but in the grid term, uh, terms, because it adds more variables and it's more complicated. So that's the next uh, step we want to take. And of course, uh, and uh, I have we have restricted current to 1200 Kelvin because the chemistry gear becomes very a big problem, especially the condensates. So we have to go to the lower temperatures, and we are looking where, into like how we can manage numerically the uh, the condensates and also clouds. That is one of the important things, like how we can manage different like more physically representative clouds for this. So that's the next step. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so if there are no other questions, well, let's thank uh, Jayesh again. Oh, wait, no, uh, Manaza has a question here. Go ahead. Uh, great talk, Jayesh. I just had a question. If, you're, if your model grid doesn't include uh, disequilibrium uh, photochemistry, yes. um, how do you parameterize the, the haze factor oh. for the models? Okay, so that is so that is our previous grid of models. Uh, that is just okay. for transmission spectrum, which has haze in it. But these are self-consistent models where we don't uh, include the. It's in the model, but not in the grid. I see. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, let's thank Jayesh again, thank and we'll you. turn it over to our next speaker. Great. Um, thank you, Jayesh and Jason. Um, so our next speaker today is Josh Dillon. Uh, Josh is an assistant project scientist in the radio astronomy lab at UC Berkeley. Uh, and he works with Aaron Parsons and the HERA team. Before that, he was also at Berkeley as an NSF astronomy and astrophysics uh, postdoctoral fellow. And before that, he was at MIT where he wrapped up his PhD in 2015 working with Max Tegmark and Jackie Hewitt. Uh, today, he'll be talking to us about uh, precision calibration of the HERA instrument for twin one centimeter cosmology. And um, Josh, just like uh, in the previous talk, if I see us getting close to the time limit, I might give you uh, a five minute warning, just letting you know so you're not surprised. And as a reminder to the audience, um, the talk is being recorded with the intention of making it publicly available on YouTube. So do let us know if you have any questions or concerns about that. And yeah, uh, Josh, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much and thanks for having me. Can everyone hear me and see my screen okay? Yes. Great. So it's nice to be uh, virtually back in Boston. I'm sad I couldn't visit in person, but perhaps next year. So today I'm gonna to be talking about progress we've been making with HERA, the Hydrogen Epic of Reionization Array, the telescope I've been working on since I actually, you know, since graduate school. Um, and since this is a, a broader talk, I, a broader audience, I'd like to give a little bit of background. So let's start with the goal of 21 century cosmology, which can be put a little bit cheekily is how do we map out the entire universe? And when we think about the cosmic microwave background, for example, as kind of making a map of the whole universe, I think we all know that what we're really doing is we're making a map of a thin shell around redshift of 1100, uh, which is to say we're taking a, effectively a baby picture of the universe, but it's not the full volume of the observable universe. And likewise, if we go and map out the volume of matter in the universe with, for example, galaxy surveys, this is now roughly to scale in the uh, co-moving volume of the universe. 
things like the slow digital sky, slow digital sky survey actually show us a relatively small volume, still an enormous volume, but a relatively small volume uh, compared to the entire observable universe. And that's where 21 centimeter cosmology comes in. The basic idea is that we're mapping out the transition the, the, uh, between the spin triplet and the spin singlet state. So when hydrogen, which is the most abundant element in the universe, undergoes that transition, it emits a photon or can absorb a photon of 21 centimeters in wavelength. That then is, comes to us redshifted by, say, a factor of 10, depending on where it came. And if we know that it was 21 centimeter emission, which is a big if, then we can figure out exactly how far away it came from by knowing the expansion history of the universe. So in principle, a huge fraction of the volume of the universe can be directly probed with this technique, unlike uh, basically any other probe. And, in, and specifically, I'm interested in the period between redshift of uh, 50 or, or maybe 25 or so and redshift of about six, when the universe is undergoing a very dramatic transformation that's difficult to observe directly in most other ways. And so this transformation looks something like this, and I apologize if the movie, movie is very laggy, but I'm happy to show you the, uh, the original. But what we're seeing here is a simulation of the universe as the first stars and galaxies are turning on and they are blowing out ionized bubbles in the intergalactic medium. So when we go and measure the 21 centimeter brightness temperature, which is our fundamental observable, we're really measuring three, uh, a combination of three different effects. We're measuring the overdensity of hydrogen. More hydrogen means more 21 centimeter. We're measuring the spin temperature, which tells us the relative population of the triplet and singlet states. And that says something about the, um, the radiation environment in which the hydrogen's in. And so that is then a probe of the first stars and the first black holes and their X-ray emission and so forth. And then of course, we're measuring the neutral fraction because, or at least a combination of things that involves the neutral fraction, because if it's ionized, the, photon, the proton and the electron are dissociated and there's no 21 centimeter emission. So how do we go measure that in practice? And our idea is to use this telescope. So this is HERA, the Hydrogen Epoch of Reionization Array, which is a collaboration of led by Berkeley, but of institutions uh, across the US and in South Africa and in Europe. And of course, I should acknowledge that we're funded by the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation, the NSF, to, which, to whom we are both very grateful. And HERA is kind of a funny telescope in a number of ways. First off, it's enormous. So it's going to be made of 350 of these 14 meter dishes. And we're looking for, you know, we're using a giant telescope in part because the signal we're looking for is so faint. Um, on the other hand, because we're looking at, you know, 21 centimeter photons have been redshifted by a factor of 10 or so. We're talking about two meter wavelengths. And at two meters, chicken wire mesh is a mirror. So our telescope, the, the physical uh, dishes are made of chicken wire mesh and PVC pipe and telephone poles, and they're very, mechanically simple things. We just point straight up uh, and we just drift scan. But the, ch the biggest challenge, more so than the sensitivity, is foregrounds. Uh, and to understand that, we have to think about, well, we have our 21 centimeter signal coming from the sky, uh, but in between us and the early universe, we have everything else, a lot of which also emits radio waves at these frequencies. And so we're seeing uh, you know, our 21 centimeter signal is something like four to five orders of magnitude dimmer than the mostly synchrotron, but also free-free dominated foregrounds. And the challenge is separating those two. And the key idea is that those foregrounds, which are our galaxy and other radio galaxies, radio quasars, for example, are emitting a uh, relatively spectrally smooth emission. Whereas the 21 centimeter signal that we're looking for interferometrically is probing different parts of the universe and therefore, therefore different ionization and spin temperature states and density states. And so we're looking for a signal that's very spectrally complicated and we're trying to separate that from something that's much brighter but spectrally smooth. So instead of uh, what we normally do when we go in, in cosmology, when we go out and measure a power spectrum, so, uh, you know, fluctuations as a function of particular spatial scales, we then, we, what we usually do is we unfold this spatial scale axis K into K parallel modes along the line of sight and K perpendicular, Fourier modes per particular line of sight. And what we do is we find this area we call the window. So the window is set by a number of factors, some of which are easier to understand. The angular extent and the angular resolution set the Fourier modes per particular line of sight that we can measure. And likewise, the intrinsic foregrounds remove, you know, we basically can't distinguish cosmology at the very low K parallel modes because of the intrinsic foregrounds. And at the top, we're limited by our frequency resolution. But there's also this factor called the wedge, which has to do with how our instrument works that, that actually takes foregrounds and adds some spectral structure to them. And to understand that, it, it's useful to get a little bit of a refresher in radio astronomy. So radio astronomy, we're measuring a quantity we call the visibility, 
um, which is not just a measurement of one particular antenna, but it's a measurement from a pair of antennas that are then correlated, uh, in our case, digitally. And what we're doing is we're measuring an integral across the sky of what each antenna sees, basically the beam, uh, you can think of that as the field of view, times whatever is actually on the sky, times a Fourier mode that has to do with the baseline separation between these two, these two antennas. And we're taking every pair of antennas, so as you might imagine, the data volume gets very big and it's, it grows as the square of the number of antennas. So a very short baseline will measure effectively a very lazy mode on the sky, the sort of the low k parallel, uh, k perpendicular Fourier modes. And likewise, a long baseline measures the fast k modes on the sky, the long k perpendicular modes. So when we see this space of k parallel versus k perpendicular, we should think about k perpendicular as really baseline length. And likewise, when we're measuring different frequencies that map to different distances, we can think of redder or bluer, and basically frequency maps to distance. And if you Fourier transform distance, you get k parallel, you Fourier transform frequency, you get time delay. So this axis that we're talking about is really a baseline length versus time delay. And what we're seeing is that the distinction between the window and the wedge, which is the basis of, of how we want to design our instrument, is in fact the light travel time along a particular baseline, the longest possible light travel time is set by a source at the horizon. And, that's, and therefore, that is setting this window and wedge. So if it's a spectrally flat thing, it can't have Fourier components beyond the, this line that denotes the horizon light travel time. And that's why HERA is designed to have as many baselines, to be almost as, as compact as possible, in order to focus our sensitivity on the shortest baselines, which have the least uh, spectral structure imparted by the instrument itself. So instead of trying to det in detail model what that spectral structure is doing and really understand every particular element of the instrument, instead we're just going to focus on where we think the instrument is least likely to impart spectral structure that we might confuse foregrounds for signal. So that is the basic philosophy of the instrument. We're, we're working in a regime of managed ignorance in order to make a more robust measurement, but that won't work if we can't calibrate. So what we actually measure is not the visibility equation that I showed you before that involves the antennas I and J, but each antenna itself also has a complex gain term, uh, which is in principle a function of frequency as well. And that represents what's going on sort of in the, in the hardware itself, the amplifiers and the cable delays and so on. And so the idea behind HERA is to use this idea of redundant baseline calibration. We have many different baselines that are measuring the same separation on the sky. You see the two in pink, for example, are the same physical distance. They're measuring the same Fourier mode on the sky. They should be the same measurement, but because of the gains, they don't look the same. Likewise, the green. And so we build up a giant system of equations. The idea is that we have, if we look at, for example, our 320 core antennas, that gives us 1,500 unique visibility measurements that we're measuring, even though we actually have 51,000 total measurements at any given time. So the idea here is that we are using that self-consistency, the idea that these things should be measuring the same thing over and over, to effectively minimize chi-square and to solve both for the gains and the visibility simultaneously. Uh, and that is the, one of the core philosophies behind HERA is, is that we're again use, you know, managing our ignorance by trying to, we don't know exactly what the array should be seeing, but we can say that these things are built to be as similar as possible. This of course is more complicated in the real world. And this is a question that I answered with one of my undergraduates, Naomi Rose, and she looked at the question of what happens if the array is not quite redundant. So we simulated a, a somewhat simplistic version of HERA with things like position errors in each antenna and pointing errors in each antenna and beam size errors in each antenna. And what we found is that when you don't have these errors, the EOR window is, is quite clean. So here I'm showing what the cosmological signal will look like in this space, and then what the foregrounds would look like. And here in, in the teal and orange, I'm showing the point where the foregrounds and the signal are equal, and where the foregrounds are uh, one-tenth of the signal. So you can think of that as, as a form of bias, effectively. And where it's you know more than 10% bias, you start to worry, are you really measuring what you think you're measuring? Uh, and when you uh, and one challenge is that the lowest k perpendicular is the, is the set of modes that have the lowest noise because that's where we focused all of our sensitivity by design. And what happens is that if you do this redundant calibration with instrumental you know, uh, antenna to antenna variation, you run into a pretty big problem, which is that you get huge, uh, a region of the, of the Fourier, of Fourier space where this sort of EOR window that's completely biased. 
Uh, and in fact, what's worse is that it's the most sensitive region. It's the highest SNR region of Fourier space that becomes biased. And I can, I'm happy to go into the details of why that is, but it has to do with the fact that all of, you know, you're solving this big linear system of equations and the long baselines are effectively talking to the short baselines. And what you could do is you could say, let's just not use the longest baselines to calibrate. You have, there's a few other approaches to this, but this is one that seems to work quite well. And that, for example, mostly eliminates this bias. So you, you have to be very careful when you're calibrating these things to not introduce low level spectral structure, because even low level spectral structure at one part in 10 to the four can then take those foregrounds that are overwhelmingly bright and move them in Fourier space to a mode that contaminates the signal of interest. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, a, a sort of a do no harm approach to our calibration, but also we have to think very carefully about how the non-idealities of our, of our observation actually affect the, the algorithms that we want to use to, to do this uh, reconstruction and to separate out the signal in the foregrounds. But so far, things seem to be working fairly well with the instrument itself, uh, given these caveats of what we know. So for here's uh, some examples of, these are called waterfalls, so on the y-axis is time, and we're looking at the phase, because the visibilities are a complex quantity, of different pairs of antennas in the array as a function of frequency. And these are all measuring the same physical separation on the ground, and so they should all look the same, and they obviously do not. So first we have to flag the bad antennas and this data set antenna 50 never works. So let's throw that one out. And then we impose this redundancy. So we're solving for all the unique visibilities and the gains simultaneously. And all of a sudden they really do start looking the same. It looks like we're measuring the same thing over and over. So we can do some masking out of radio frequency interference. Uh, and then we have to actually, there's a couple of modes that we can't measure with this redundancy, which we call the degeneracies of redundant baseline calibration. And for there, we can fix an absolute sky reference, which involves doing traditional radio astronomy, things like making images and comparing that to a model and you know showing that we have a reasonable ability to image the sky, at least in certain fields. Uh, and that's a whole long process that I'd be happy to talk more about, but it's not super interesting other than to say that you know we can fix an absolute sky reference. And what's nice is that the instrument is, is actually looking quite stable from day to day. So here's an example of one of these waterfalls again uh, on a particular baseline on a particular day. And then as we integrate up, so our first um, power spectrum results, we're expecting to come from about 18 days of data. And as we integrate down, things really do look like they're integrating down more or less like noise at most Fourier mode. So I can show that a little bit more precisely by looking at the power spectrum. So here we're looking at a particular baseline as a function of k parallel or, or k. And we can see at, you know, at seven minutes, things look mostly like noise, except at the very lowest k parallel, that's the foreground dominated region. And as we start integrating down, we actually start seeing some funny bump around k of 0.5 which is a systematic that we've actually isolated and are, are able to remove with a, a, a filter in temporal space, as it turns out. Uh, something called a fringe rate filter, if people are particularly interested. And I'd be happy to talk about that more. But the point is, is that we are integrating down and things are pretty close to consistent with noise. I have uh, deeper power spectrum and more binned power spectrum, but I think that they are embargoed by the collaboration for now, but we're hoping as we're going through now sort of an end-to-end -end validation test where we're simulating a, a near full data set and running it through all of our analysis pipeline that we will be able to validate that we, you know, when we eject a signal, we get back what we, what we expect. And therefore we have high confidence that what we're planning to publish in the next couple of months is really a, a genuine upper limit on what we should measure. So this is just 18 nights of data. We're expecting, uh, we have about a hundred total nights in the can from this first iteration of HERA. And I'm excited to, to push forward and do a better job of doing upper limits with that, but I don't think that's the end of the story. So we're also simultaneously completely upgrading and overhauling the instrument. In particular, we've upgraded our feeds. So we are now observing from 50 to 250 megahertz roughly with these new Vivaldi feeds, which look a, a, a little scary, but they are designed to have a very wide bandwidth. And this will allow us to do a number of things. So first off, this will allow us to go to much higher redshift. Uh, so this is the kind of, you know, here with the Hera 61 was roughly the kind of sensitivity you might expect with 100 days of that original system. And if we were, you know, we were not super likely to make a detection, but, you know, if it, we did, it would be very marginal and probably reported as an upper limit. But with the full system and the wide bandwidth, we should be able to go after 
the signal both at low redshift and higher redshift, and also potentially, and I'd be happy to talk more about this, though I don't want to say too much, be able to go after the uh, claim detection of the global signal measurement by the EDGES experiment. The EDGES experiment, for as some background, um, reported a very anomalously large detection of a dip in the global signal. And if that's true, that should also vastly increase the amplitude of the fluctuations because it's hard to increase the, the average signal with also, without also increasing the amplitude of the fluctuations. And that should then affect the power spectrum, which should be easily measurable by HERA. So we are observing now uh, with this full band system and we're building out toward, you know, we've got something like 100 uh, antennas working now and we're, we should be able to get enough data to say something about edges this observing season. But we also want to do a lot of the original science that we propose. So for example, we're interested in measuring the ionization history of the universe and using, um, using our measurement of, of the, how the epoch of reionization proceeded to basically nail down the ionization history of the universe. So compared to the current constraints of what we know about how reionization proceeded, using these 21 centimeter measurements, we should be able to really very precisely say, here is the pro here is the timeline of reionization. There's a little model dependence in here, but not a ton. Uh, and what that then allows us to do, which I think is particularly interesting to our friends in the CMB world, is to remove the degeneracy between A sub S, the amplitude of fluctuations, scalar fluctuations from inflation, and tau, which is the integrated optical depth due to reionization. And so if we can measure the, the how reionization proceeded to very high accuracy, this basically eliminates this degeneracy in the CMB, which then allows the CMB to much better uh, measure A sub S and potentially also the sum of the neutrino masses and per perhaps uh, with CMBS4, for example, distinguishing between the inverted and normal hierarchy of neutrino masses, which would be very exciting. Uh, I also wanted to highlight that there's some cool stuff we could do based on some local work at, at Harvard. Uh, so Julian Munoz has been doing some really neat uh, uh, theoretical work on the effect of, for example, the relative velocities of baryons to dark matter, which can have an impact on star formation, which should then, because that early star formation has an impact on 21 centimeter, uh, on the 21 centimeter brightness temperature via the, the spin temperature, that can actually imprint a unique signal that looks like uh, an acoustic oscillation, but this is from that relative velocity of baryons to dark matter, which should be in principle observable with HERA with a few years of observation. And likewise, by a similar effect, uh, you could also look for how you can say something about the very high K power spectrum. So these are K modes that we don't directly access uh, of, the, of the dark matter power spectrum itself by looking at how that those modes affect the creation of, of stars early on. So the, the more power there is at small spatial scales, the earlier stars will form and that will affect the 21 centimeter signal. And so if, for example, the power spectrum is suppressed by warm dark matter or fuzzy dark matter, or some, some uh, non you know, CTM version of dark matter that will affect the power spectrum at high K that's quite difficult to access, which will then affect the formation of stars, which will then affect the 21 centimeter uh, the 21 centimeter signal. So that's a little bit model dependent, but it's a really interesting regime that we really don't have any other direct handles on how, you know, when were the first stars forming and where were they forming? And so that's super interesting as well. Uh, but I wanna also, in the last bit of this talk, talk about what I think is coming next beyond HERA. So I, I think I've tried to make the case at least that HERA is the easiest path forward to a very high SNR detection, but because it is such a complicated physical, Thing. It's hard to really know where every you know, stick and piece of metal and piece of PVC is in this thing and then model it in a computer. I think probably the future is a much bigger array of smaller, simpler antennas. And I think that's the kind of instrument that we might actually be able to understand more directly. So there's a challenge with that. And that comes back to this equation I mentioned with visibilities, where what we're actually measuring is that we're measuring the voltage at each antenna um, so VI is the, is the ith antenna. We're Fourier transforming that to frequency. And then we're cross-correlating every pair of antennas. So that scales, as I mentioned, like O of n squared, the number of antennas squared. And the computational complexity of that goes as O of n squared. And there is a way to do that faster. And that is based on, on a very deep, but also kind of, um, you know, in, in retrospect, sort of obvious truth, which is that all telescopes are fundamentally Fourier transformers, not just radio interferometers. 
And one way to think about this is to think about, for example, the Hubble or any other optical telescope, we're effectively converting an angle on the sky to a position on the focal plane. And if I just recast that in the language of physics, that's a photon momentum being converted into a position, which sounds, if we remember from quantum mechanics, just like a Fourier transform. So what you could do is take this equation and rewrite it somewhat suggestively as instead of looking at the baseline, we're looking at differences in position, which is basically the same thing. And if those xi and xj, which is the positions of these antennas, are on a regular grid, then effectively what we can do is directly sample the electric field Fourier transform and square and get beam weighted maps. And if it's on a regular grid, you could do that Fourier transform with an FFT, a fast Fourier transform. Uh, and that allows you to perform this correlation in O of n log n. So in principle, and I, I mean this not entirely seriously, a, an FFT telescope like this could be much bigger than HERA, and in fact, much, much, much bigger than HERA. So I'm not proposing filling the horizon with the uh, HERA type dishes, but I think that this sort of gives an example that we could be start to think about arrays with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dishes, assuming that we could demonstrate that this technology works. Um, so an FFT telescope like this would need to be coplanar in order for this FFT uh, technique to work. And it would need to be made up of very identical elements. Otherwise, the wedge would be contaminated, like I, I mentioned before. And it needs to be on either a regular or hierarchically regular grid. So there's actually a little bit more flexibility in what you can do there. And HERA, for example, is designed to actually be, be on a hierarchically, hierarchically regular grid that could be, in principle, FFT. And it has to be calibrated in real time because this data savings is effectively a data compression step. Um, and you are, you, know, you are not doing as many calculations and you're not writing down as many numbers. And so you're combining pieces of data together. And if they are not relatively calibrated, then you're effectively combining nonsense with nonsense and it's unrecoverable. So it has to be relatively calibrated in real time, but that's precisely what redundant calibration is designed to do, is to allow you to have relative calibration of your elements you don't need that absolute gain scale. You just need that the relative calibrations you can something you can sum like with like, uh, and continue on like that. So <clears throat> the uh, the technology that we're developing with Hera to do this redundant calibration, I think, will be a a cornerstone for enabling these future telescopes that go to much higher, you know, much larger numbers of elements using this FFT technology. So this is one of the arguments that I and my collaborators made in our Astro 2020 white paper, which I'd be happy to point people to. But basically, as we move from HERA to the next generation late in, in the coming, or the current decade, like it's already 2020, uh, the, we want to think about how we demonstrate these technologies as we move forward, and how do we design future telescopes uh, either optimized for imaging reionization or pushing back further into the cosmic dawn, uh, what kinds of elements are ideal for that, and how do we do the calibration that will enable the separation of foregrounds from uh, inst from the from the cosmological signal that we're looking for using these kinds of techniques that we are trying to pioneer with Hera? So, I'll sum up by saying that hopefully people are excited that 21 centimeter cosmology could become one day a premier probe of our universe and gives us access to the majority of the volume of the universe. Uh, in particular, above RefGIC 6, the intergalactic medium that's quite hard to probe directly uh, by any other means. And HERA in particular is this very purpose-built telescope that's really focused on doing 21 centimeter cosmology above all else. And it's designed to be robust in a number of ways and to have this sort of trade-off between um, precise knowledge of the instrument and uh, managed ignorance that allows us to get more sensitivity, cheaper, faster, uh, while still being focused on the science at hand. And it's going to be a very large telescope, despite not being a super expensive telescope, that will be observing uh, at least through 2023. And we're going to use our power spectra to constrain the epoch of reionization and hopefully eventually precisely measure the 21 centimeter power spectrum during the epoch of reionization and push toward lower frequencies or higher redshifts to follow up on the purported edges detection, uh, which would be very exciting if it turns out to be true. But I think there's a lot of reasons to still be skeptical. It certainly hasn't been replicated by any other team. Uh, and finally, uh, hopefully the, the instrumental and analysis legacy of this telescope will allow us to chart the future of the field, which I think is much larger arrays, 
of smaller, uh, more identical elements that then are combined using a fast Fourier transform telescope technique that lets us get around this O of n squared problem of correlation and lets us build very large data sets without necessarily a huge expense. So with that, thank you so much. And I'd be happy to take questions and I'm excited to meet people later today. Awesome, thank you so much, Josh, for this excellent, excellent talk. Um, let's go to questions from the audience. So please uh, use the raise your hand feature from Zoom. Um, and there we go, we have Julian, go ahead. Uh, great talk, Josh, as always. Uh, Thank so you. I wanted to ask you about this FFT thing, because it's always fascinated me uh, in, in theory, but there's a few things I never understood about the FFT telescope. So for the power spectrum, it seems like you wrote the equation of what you can do, right? C can, you, can you get higher point or a correlation functions as well? Or, or do you need a, with the same array, same cost, can you do by spectrum, say? Uh, yeah, so effectively what you're doing is you're mapping. Uh, the thing that you are measuring is if you if you take the electric field that you're measuring at each point effectively, you are taking the FFT of that, you are creating a map. Uh, and then how to actually grid that from multiple observations is a little bit of tricky math. And there's, there's a, a bunch of work in the literature on how to do map making. But effectively, you're making a beam weighted map. And so from a map, you can compute, in principle, any uh, higher order correlation beyond the power spectrum. Although, you know, certainly beyond the power spectrum, things get quite noisy. But yeah, there's, there's been a number of efforts looking at what you can do with the bi-spectrum. I personally haven't been paying that close attention to it because it doesn't feel to me like the lowest hanging fruit, but I understand why theorists want to uh, make predictions that are two steps ahead of where the observers are. Okay, yeah, essentially, uh, it, it's higher cost probably than n log n, but it's still doable. That's what I should get from that. Oh, I actually don't think it's even a cost issue because you're just making a map. You're making, you know, pixels on the sky as a function of frequency. And then that is a data product that, that you could average over time, right? There's only one sky. We're not really thinking about transients here, though I, there are people who also want to use some of these similar telescopes. If you look at the Puma team, for example, want to use telescopes that are looking at lower redshift to also do FRBs, which I think is really interesting. But setting aside transients for a minute, uh, the data volume of the map itself is compressed because you are combining multiple days together and also multiple nearby observations together with overlapping fields of view. So at the end of the day, the data product here is a 3D data cube. It could be still quite big, uh, but it's not the same size as the full N squared correlations that are coming out of the correlator, which is an enormous data volume. Um, I mean, Hera is going to be producing... Um, I'm trying to remember the exact size of the, the data, but it's it's many petabyte, it, or it's like order a petabyte a night when it's done. And we can't save all that data. We have to find ways to compress it. Okay, so actually that, that brings to my follow-up question, which is you mentioned that you designed Hera to be able to do this to some extent. Is this like on the, is this like, you know, on the timeline that you guys are actually gonna try to make this work with Hera? That's a good question. Uh, there's a graduate student at, at Berkeley uh, Deep T. Gorty, who's thinking about this quite a bit. I think it would be done most likely if we do it, it won't be, you know, with Hera, we don't need to uh, because we have designed it so that there is not so much data volume that we can't store what we need after some level of LST binning. Petabyte, and I think it's wrong. I think it was a petabyte or a few petabytes a season. I forget the number offhand. I'd have to look that up. But anyway, the point being that I think we are interested in doing some experiments where we take, for example, uh, a subset of the antennas and, and do a dedicated experiment with them. We're not funded yet to do like a season of observation and to build out a whole FFT correlator. But that's certainly something people are thinking about, you know, what, when the nominal lifetime of this thing is done, what kinds of experiments can we do with the telescopes that we have or some subset of them in order to you know, con you know, continue on the field. So there's, in our sort of broad timeline of things that we might do, there's this idea of extended, of extending Hera, which I don't think we know yet what exactly we want to do, or using Hera as a platform for technology demonstration. These are all ideas that we like to do in kind of the latter half of the decade in order to be ready for whatever comes next and to demonstrate that we have the ability to really 
robustly separate foregrounds and understand our instrument. And so Hera, you know, it's very difficult to make these dishes all identical, um, which is in principle the assumption of the FFT technique. In, and if, you, if they're not, you have to be very careful about how you handle ca uh, calibration and combine data in a way that doesn't, de um, that doesn't decohere. But it's at least worth trying. Yeah, I agree. Right, thanks a lot. Okay, we certainly have time for another question from the audience. Um, in the meantime, I'll just ask, you mentioned that the data you've shown so far is from 18 nights. Uh, I was just wondering what set that, what was the limit on those, that number 18? Um, <laughs> it was more sociological than anything. I think we, we had this, this idea that we would, that the team that is sort of leading the commissioning of the telescope who sort of blesses like this night, this bit of data looks good. The analysis team, which is what I lead will, uh, should go and dig deep on it. And so we've been doing this sort of stage set of internal data releases where it's like, okay, here's a night and then here's a few weeks and then here's a season. So it was kind of, I think it was like three weeks and then we ended up throwing out a few nights because they had very bad radio frequency interference. So, you know, it's from 21 days to 18 days, but it was, it's not a, there isn't any special science there. It's just, it was an amount of data that we could iterate on, um, relatively quickly and sort of process all of it in a day or two. And so we could continue to iterate and develop our analysis software as we better understood some of the, uh, the systematics and the data and how to, how to mitigate them. Uh, but there's no, nothing particularly special about that other than if we, you know, the time to science would be longer if we tried to do the full season and it makes sense to take a bite-sized portion, although I, this is a, a pretty big bite and push it to the science and then go back through with more data is the plan. That makes sense. Okay, um, well, if there's no further questions, we are past the hour. Um, if anyone would like more discussion, please sign up with the speakers and uh, thank you both one more time. See you all next week. Thank you very much. Thank you for organizing. Thank you for having me. Thank all you right. for organizing. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.